This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is brought to you by Codecademy. Codecademy has helped 45 million people level up their careers with interactive coding tutorials, and now Codecademy Pro is making it easier to learn code more than ever. With a simple mobile app, customized learning paths, and quizzes that you can use to check your progress, all starting at just $20 a month. Get 50% off your first month of Codecademy Pro by going to codecademy.com slash test and entering the promo code TEST at checkout. Codecademy Pro, the easiest way to learn to code. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, September 13th, 2018, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Dot com. Welcome to this very magical day, <laughs> very magical podcast on a very magical day. How's everyone feeling? Magical. Uh, also magical. Yeah, very, very magical. So it's our best podcast ever. So delighted and thrilled to unveil to everyone the podcast. Mm-hmm. This is only a test. Mm-hmm. S Max. This is the best podcast we've ever made. Ever. It's revolutionary. Absolutely. And it's podcasting. Wait, I forgot my all white weird old man sneakers for this. Whoa. <laughs> Hold they, on. They That's did, a personal attack, they, sure. They looked rather new. They did look new. <laughs> uh, we are of course talking about the top story this week, which we're going to I guess we should just jump right into, right? Top story this week. As we were recording this, we have just finished watching the September Apple launch event, they call it their keynote. I don't like calling it a keynote mm-hmm. because it is not a, what is it, a keynote too? Right. It's not a bunch of other less yeah. interesting It's not. It's not talks. a conference. It's, no. not, it's not like opening remarks to something. But they're using keynote they to are. deliver. Uh. So maybe capital K keynote in that sense. It's, it's like the Kleenex of presentations. They just co-opted the word. Yeah. To, to, to talk about announcements. You know, back when they were attached to, like, a Macworld Expo, it made sense. They were the featured keynote presenter. Now it's just in their 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 spaceship, in, in their auditorium. It's a press conference. Well, it's totally a press conference. But I, I always remember those conferences as being mostly press. This felt like it was such a mix of employees. Has well, it always been that way? They, they, need, they need someone to applaud. Yeah. Oh, so they bring in the employees yeah. as applause machines. It was like a little rowdy at the beginning, how raucous they New were. New theater. You know, it's not Bill Graham Civic. It's not Moscone Center in San Francisco. So they couldn't fill it with the, the, the ratio of employees to, to press uh, was probably a little bit skewed. And I would bet they probably mic'd up their employee section a little bit more in the sound mixing. Hmm. So it felt more the cheering. But I don't I, – I know – Everyone says on Twitter, I'm surprised that press clap at these things. I don't think at this point any press actually clap. And if you do, shame on you. You should go there to be objective and, and, and not be clapping at a press conference, except for the polite clapping at the mm-hmm. end for the presentation as a whole, but not for individual products or, or features. That's, mm-hmm. that's, not, that's not for us. Mm-hmm. So uh, they opened this event. We're going to talk. This is our top story easily. Lots of things we anticipated, lots of things that we that were leaked that we had previously covered on this podcast. Many of those, most of those confirmed, some of those still maybe yet to come. But they opened it with a tweet. Did you see this? Tim Cook tweeted. No. Oh. I, they did actually do some interesting things on Twitter. Because yesterday they posted a tweet that said if you um, want to get a, an alert for, yeah. the, for the event, favorite this or like this yeah, tweet. Click the heart. And so I did that. Immediately I got like tweeted to by Apple. Like at Apple tweeted at me. Interesting. Saying uh, thanks for liking. We'll let you know when the thing's going to start. And then they did today. They tweeted. They, mu- they must have ought to have built in back end features with Twitter and paid for that type of access. Because if you went to the Twitter website or even loaded up the app, the live stream for the conference was playing this whole morning. So anyone who opened up twitter.com yeah could have just watched it there it, that's not dissimilar for twitter to do versus other big events that totally. have happened 
but it's the, just we usually don't see it for like a tech press conference or a corporate event. Usually, yeah. it's for like a news news or event sports maybe. or something. Yeah, exactly. Like sporting events, I would call those commercial events as well. This is, this is purely a commercial event. Uh, Tim Cook tweeted. It was a very. It looked like it was a uh, a mistweet, like an hmm. accidental tweet. It was the tweet was, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase. No, period. Can someone bring it to us? Who can bring it to us? Oh, that's cool. And it looked like a text message that was missent as a tweet. Yeah. Like a very stern, no, who can bring it to us? What does he mean? What does he mean? Like, what, what are you doing here? What are you doing, Tim? And, of course, uh, anyone who watched Apple's press conference knows that it opened with a video that explained what that was about. It was a, a funny video. Corny as hell. Corny, quote-unquote, dad joke video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, showing off the new campus of one of their employees or an actor running through the campus you know, parkouring through the campus with a briefcase, which uh, sensibly for viewers would be the new hardware that was to be announced and revealed, but instead it was the clicker. It was all set to the um, uh, Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible theme, theme. yeah. Uh, they, got, they, they got the money. They can pay for the rights. Yes, so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, open up very standard Apple press conference with the success of their stores, talking about how happy they are over the past quarter. You know, it's, it's a, a partially an investor check-in as well, right, for the, a public-facing check-in on, on their business success. Didn't mention the trillion-dollar valuation. That was not... Oh, so modest of them. <laughs> he cashed those stock, cashed that stock. When you're <laughs> one of two companies, <laughs> no need to brag. Yeah. So, uh, and then rolled into the first product. So I think it was, we can talk basically two product categories that they talked about, the Apple Watch mm -hmm. and the iPhone, mm -hmm. and start with the, the Apple Watch. The long-awaited redesign of the Apple Watch, the Series 4. Has there already been four years since the launch of the watch? The well, Apple you got to count zero, zero, too, right? So it's like one would be the first year, after the first year. So, yeah, has it been like four complete years? Maybe so. Wow. That feels like... It feels like a long time. I don't know. Maybe, maybe as I recall, maybe the, the one was like a half. It yeah. was in between. Right. So they they yeah, updated soon after, kind of like the right. first iPhone and the 3G. Yeah. It, it was a pr pr quick refresh. But this is the first time that's a whole new form factor, uh, although it looks very similar to the old Just launch. under four years. April 24th, 2015 was the Series Zero. Three and a half years. Okay. Three wow. and a half years. That, that makes, yep. in my mind, that makes more sense. So anyone who bought early adopters mm -hmm. bought the Apple Watch three and a half years ago. And that's when... That's when it, they announced it. They didn't even ship it till the end of the, uh, till later that year. No, no, it was, it was around April. Yeah. Um, anyone who bought it, mm -hmm. I guess your your watch is pretty pretty obsolete. You're, uh, well, you I'll can't even you. install the new watch OS. You can't install the new watch OS. And anecdotally, if anyone I know who has the first zero Series Zero uh, Apple Watch, their battery life is not great. Not true. Not true. Mine still lasts all day. It is really sluggish, though. Like, if I'm pulling Slow. up menus, mm. there's a delay. Oh. Yeah. I, I know people who've had battery. It doesn't just, it, the charge won't last them all day. So wow. your mileage but may vary. Do you on have how a much phone that is three and a half years old that maintains its charge? I don't think that's reasonable. I have, I have a Psycho, you know, Seiko watch that 20 years old that, no, that, that holds its charge That's all day. adorable. Yeah. Calculator watch. Bring, bring that one back. So what's new with the new watch? So uh, new form factor, larger screen. They now call it the screen is what forty millimeters and forty two millimeters or mm -hmm. two sizes. There's a smaller version and a bigger version. And to be clear, the screen is like they're measuring the screen beneath the glass. So the the form factor of the watch in terms of width looks probably about the same. Right. But they've they've made the screen inside of it bigger. Which is an interesting way to measure measure the phone, small and big, mm -hmm. right? Because it's <clears throat> when you think about watch sizes, when people buy traditional watches, they talk about the diameter of that circle for how big it fits on your wrist. Here they're talking about screen size. Um, so form factor surface area wise looks the same. They say it's thinner, right. although we didn't get to really see. You guessed whether, that. You saw those leaked photos and you said, said, that's not. That looks a little thinner. It, look, it, it looked is, a little thinner. It is 0.7 millimeters see, that thinner. Is, that, that is, according that to is the not thinner to me. But that is, oh. if it's less than a millimeter thinner, it has that bulb, bulbous bottom, which they need for the heart rate detection underneath it. I do not expect to be impressed when I see this in person with the the physical form factor, regardless of how big the screen is now. I don't know, man. Like I'm thinking, like as a 3D printer guy, like 0.7 millimeters is three whole layers. For I mean, an Android, that is an eternity. It is a long. That's a, that's a decent. I mean, anything on your wrist, you're gonna feel yeah, like yeah. up to a millimeter, but it's not thinner in the way they described. Uh, I'll put this graphic in the show notes, but there's a good graphic that shows like the relative size right. of, of the devices, old to new, and essentially. 
they are the same form factor, even though the numbers seem bigger. But the usable screen area is bigger, but it's rounded versus the square off the old Apple Series watches. So in terms of usable space, because you don't, when you have rounded corners, you don't really have utility in that space. Mm -hmm. It's not as uh, as bigger as the numbers would seem to claim. Well, mm. what they've done to compensate for that is you, uh, is uh, curve the complications, mm -hmm. so text and numbers and all kinds of graphics, and that can now, now be corners. oriented and curve around those ca uh, corners. Yeah, right. You can pack more into the corners, and it's less wasted space. Sure. Well, who needs eight complications on on the, on their watch? That sounds awfully complicated to me. <laughs> uh, there are just like the last one. It's it's a complicated pricing and model scheme too because these watches one they start at a higher base price yeah and we're jumping the price without talking about features because this is something you should know the the previous generation series three the base model um in one size was uh 330 dollars that's now decreased to 280 dollars but these now start at 400 dollars ouch and that's without the cellular model? No, that's which, like the, usually if they go to the top tier, it maintains the price point. Mm -hmm. But this is a $70 price increase. That's right. $70 price increase, 400 and 430 if you want the slightly bigger one, which uh, a lot of people will want. And then add $100 to that if you want cellular capability, LTE, with, of course, a monthly price plan with a uh, carrier. And then that's for the aluminum model. If you want the stainless steel model, mm. those start at $700, and that's cellular only. So these are still f premium with a capital P products. Uh, and uh, I, I guess they, feel like they felt like they were justified in raising the price and that, that the market would be there. That's the thing we don't know, that whether like what the churn cycle is for someone like you, Jeremy, who bought – a first, uh, first gen mm -hmm. Apple Watch. Yep. I bought a first gen Apple Watch for Danica. I'm not going to upgrade her to this new one because I'm not going to spend another four hundred to five hundred dollars on a watch uh, that will have to get bought again another, another three and a half years. Well, why isn't it worth it to you? What else does this watch have besides a larger screen? So they really double down on the the the, the bio data you can track. Right. And sports is their number one killer feature for this. You notice they didn't Fit, talk about... Fitness for sure. Fitness for sure. It's it's not the third party. It's not about calling Ubers. It's not about, you know, the bank statements, which there are plenty of these third party uh, watch uh, counterparts to your uh, phone apps. Well, they have three years of metrics now to see what people are actually using the watch for. Yeah, and I can tell you from three years of using my watch... <laughs> you have your own metrics? I, my metrics, yeah. I, I use it to tell time and I use it to access Siri. Well, yeah. I mean, let's talk about a couple of the features they did tout, which are a little below the radar. We're going to come back to the health stuff because there's a lot of science to unpack there. Uh, but they said the the back is now made of ceramic, so now radio can penetrate both sides, and we improved the speaker, so mm -hmm. now you can make calls with your watch more easily. Twice as loud, they said, I think. Yeah. So I, does that speak to you as a feature that's interesting? Uh, that's useful. It's not worth upgrading for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I felt about it, too. Mm -hmm. Incre like the new processor, which gives you you know up to two times the speed, whatever that means. Did, now, what about that? Now, for me, the, as a Series Zero owner, that's compelling. Oh, because your watch is a little it's sluggish? quite slow, yeah. But the, do you use those features? Do you use the apps? It's No, I don't use the apps, but just notifications, just pulling down whatever that uh, control center is where you mm -hmm. turn on mute. Just day-to-day just -day use, yes, usability. Exactly. The theater mode. And that's yep, the exactly. thing I press most. Exactly. Uh, but in, in there's local storage, like for people who want to sideload music onto it to use on a for fitness to, to pair mm -hmm. with their AirPods. And I'm guessing this new Uber uh, watch face will not be available on older phones because it t mm. it takes up so much of, the, of that extra real estate. I I would Uber not the app. I would the, look the, the no, complicated <laughs> exactly the overcomplicated watch yeah. face. I actually like that watch face, so I would look forward to using that. Interesting. All right. Um, Can can I talk about the health stuff? Yet? Please do. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one the, of the big, big cells. This is a big, massive. Th this was interesting for me because this is the most science I've seen in an Apple presentation yeah. yet. Uh, so let's talk about the watch, uh, the last series watch. So they touted something called uh, the heart rate monitor being used to detect something called AFib, atrial fibrate, fibril, ugh, oh whatever. My. You heard me say it. Yep. Um, and about one in four people that are suffering from heart disease are at risk for AFib. 
uh, which is a leading cause of stroke. Basically, your heart rhythm goes out of syncopation, like, and it can those spikes can lead to either a heart attack or stroke. Can I ask a question yeah, briefly? Yeah. How long would you be in that state before having a stroke? You could be years. It could be it could be momentary. Okay. Um, so one of the key tricks with AFib is, or the key challenges is that you need continuous monitoring to really detect this. Because if you only come in symptomatic, they're gonna hook you up to a machine, but you have to sit there and wait for your heart to go out of rhythm to detect this. So oftentimes that's hard to do. So continuous monitoring, super important. Last year, Apple uh, worked on a study with UCSF and Stanford. They had 51 patients that they knew were at risk for uh, cardiovascular systems come in. The people in the hospital put the watch on them Mm. And then had a com- controlled study to see if this was validated measure of AFib. Mm-hmm. And they found 97% accuracy as compared to the medical diagnostic. That number sounds really high, but that is not equivalent. You need 99% for it to be the equivalent of a, of a diagnostic in the hospital. Was it 97% with uh, swing which way? So that's false a C, that's, or that's or called it? a C statistic. So it takes into account these, these false positives and not. Basically, like this is, if you just take a binary of zero and one and say zero means you don't have this condition, one you do, that's not quite how AFib works. There's mm-hmm. lots of degrees there. Uh, this is saying like how predictive uh, is it to identify people that have a high probability of AFib. And it was like 0.97 on that scale, but you really want it to be 0.99 on this scale. There's a lot of unpacking to do on the statistics there, but the point is small sample size, um, a very promising results, but it's not a diagnostic. It doesn't take into account user Yes, it doesn't account for real world conditions because somebody else is putting it on under controlled conditions. Well, how would you, is there, could they build in the system to do a calibration pass and say, they you could put on your watch the right way? So there's an emergent, uh, there's a study coming out from Stanford. Um, so with watch users using Series 4, they could opt into this Stanford study that's running through the end of 2018. And so in early 2019, we'll know the results of this. But basically, this is promising. What doctors mostly say is this continuing monitoring would be awesome for somebody that shows up in my ICU that has risk for this. For somebody that is like healthy in there, you know, and has healthy conditions like us that were asymptomatic for mm-hmm. this kind of stuff, uh, you're going to get a lot of false positives with the AFib thing. But it's I w- trending the right way. I wonder, though, if they'll compensate for that by not alerting you after the first time it senses it, and then maybe not even after the second. But if they get enough data from you over the course of days, maybe then they say, okay, maybe check this out. So that's one layer. Second layer they didn't talk about at all is the privacy of this information. Now you're recording health information that's getting close to diagnostic level They did say that would fit in the enclave. Yeah, so it's going to be encrypted, but once you share that information, where does how does that information get used? Because are we considering your watch a diagnostic, reliable source of information in the same way that we do in the hospital from a privacy standpoint? Like, is it a data point insurance should have access to? Hmm. Yeah. That's a Good big question. open question. I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. Um, third, let's talk about what they debuted with the uh, ECG, the electrocardiogram. Uh, data. This is interesting. So everyone, you saw Twitter blow up being like Apple Watch, the first FDA certified uh, device on the market. That what does that even mean? It won't kill you. It doesn't mean anything. Well, FDA it means, you can it s- means something, but it doesn't. Well, let's mean explain something. how it works. So you touch the digital crown, and there's a, a some sort of a, a capacitive mm-hmm. touch sensor on there, and using the combination between that and the underlying sensor beneath the watch, it will over 30 seconds uh, diagnose your your heart rhythm. Yeah, I mean, essentially uh, monitoring electrical impulses through your your body at that point. A typical ECG in the hospital has 12 leads on it. So this is like down to two. So that there's like a, a functional like engineering problem they had to overcome mm. with getting reliable data. So as, like not knowing the details of that, let, let's just say they did that. What they did as a next step is basically the FDA regulates any products that has health claims on it. And so there's different levels of FDA certification that you can go through. Like a drug that I ingest for a medical condition has to go through a pretty strict protocol. This kind of thing is classified under like a medical device. Um, And loosely it goes through something called de novo certification. They use the term in the presentation. 
this is a kind of certification that like 23andme went through for its genetic test it's a much lighter certification that was made about 10 years ago. And essentially the FDA just says, hey, this is a low risk device. Does it essentially do what it claims without any major risk to the patient? And the FDA hasn't listed their decision summary yet, so we don't know what they actually think of it, but it has passed. I don't think it's that big of a deal from, a, from an FDA, clear, FDA cleared, like slap a label on this thing kind of thing because it doesn't tell the consumer much information. What is more interesting is a tech company actually going through that process because FDA processes are slow. Mm. So typically they wouldn't do this because an FDA certification could take a year, which is their product cycle, right? So why would you get something, cert like they would get the series four certified by now kind of thing. Is this a way to force it to do the AFib test or is this useful in other ways? The certification? No, no, no. The um the ECG, the yeah. ECG is super huge deal if it works because this is the kind of diagnostic test that can tell us a lot more than just AFib. Oh, what else? I mean, it like it gives us all sorts of information on heart rhythm and patterns. And if you collect that data over over time, that could be incredibly useful if it's certified as having diagnostic data. Hmm. They do not share any of the underlying science. Yeah. Um, behind this, so I'm going to be fully skeptical until we see that the data says that this is a valid ECG. And ECG and EKG are the same. Yeah, uh, they're the same thing. Interchangeable. Okay. Yeah, and there's just I different think EKG acronym. is is what many people hear as, as the acronym. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it, but it's it's basically the same thing. I mean, you're talking about like a diagnostic tool that a cardiologist uses, and if they don't have to, you can imagine a world, let's say, ten years from now, where that's reliable enough. Now, we, now the cardiologist doesn't have to order that. They can just look at your results, interpret them for you. How much of a, ma a savings in, in dollars for the healthcare industry is that? Well, well also the, the sampling. You, you, if it's something you build into your routine, as you then it's just the over time that sample data gives you a lot more information. I, I look at the health features of the Apple Watch as being precautionary and giving you a heads up that there might be something that you should visit the doctor to have officially checked out. Yeah, and so some physicians have gone onto Twitter and say like. So the only problem with that, and, and problem, you know, in quotes, like small c problem, is that we're going to generate a lot of false positives and a lot of visits to doctors where there isn't the rest of the ecosystem that should make you concerned for but, this. But for that one guy for whom it's uh, it works, and yes. he's now alive because he went to the doctor that time, he's an Apple user for life. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, contracts are going to love this. And <laughs> this is building on that fear. I mean, that's not, yeah. did, the, did the same thing, right? People freak out about and, and they kind of lead into that in the press conference it, it really the tone was this is going to save your life or this could sa this could save your life one day i was I, surprised they didn't go into the stories for whom people have had that experience because it, it's been widely public publicized a handful of times that the apple watch has alerted the user to you can get conditions. into trouble for doing that from a certification standpoint mm. so i think they laid off from that perspective the numbers are on their side like if you know Four million people have uh, AFib risk. It's probably closer to ten have AFib ri risk. Their positive rate can be like 001 percent, and they're going to save a bunch of people's lives. I mean, now I want to get one of these for my parents. There you go. I think that's the thing. I think with when we combine it with like the fall recognition. So like, let's talk about that for a sec. So it, they've added, they've improved the accelerometer, and they have the new processor, and which is a fascinating thing in itself because it's it's a tech that is has been in the first iPhone, right? The, the gyroscope accelerometer. Yes. And it's the I thing th that I don't, we don't talk I don't think, about. I don't think gyro was in the first one. I think they added just, that later. Yeah, just accelerometer. Yeah. And that, and, and the, of course, the popularization and commercialization and the widespread adoption of that kind of tech made a bunch of other things possible. Uh, VR, one right. of them, among yep, one yep, of them. Yep. But it's a thing that we don't talk about, we don't think about improving year over year, uh, much like we do with CPU, GPU, and yep. other components. But it is a commodity technology that still can be improved. And they say this new quote unquote next gen accelerometer gyroscope yep. is more accurate in its details. It pulls at nine times as, as many times using the same amount of power. Oh, is that what they said? Yeah. Wow. It, it's just like the polling rate's faster. And the thing that hmm. is really interesting is that it is data that is not really tapped into right now. I know, for example, car companies like, like Uber and Lyft takes that information and can predict crashes mm. and other 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 car events in your cars. And you could do the same with people. Like that is passive data that we freak out all the time wondering about what Facebook's going to use, uh, the, the, the eye tracking data or, or whatever future head tracking data they yeah. have on the VR headsets. 
the phones and the watches are doing the same thing. But well, the laptops have done this for a while now, where if, if they detect that they're going to fall, uh, they will sh they will shut down certain systems. I think they were doing these even when they had like physical hard drives, and they would stop the head from touching yeah. the, the the disc. Um, well, now the, the Apple Watch is going to supposedly have the same feature where it will detect if you're falling, and then once you've fallen, if it detects like a hard stop, it will give you the option of, of single tapping an SOS call. And all and, you have to do is deep and learning. It, and it will call your contacts that are set up that way. And if, if they detect a no motion after a fall for one minute, it will automatically call 911. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about that, because talk about false positives. Oh. I've fallen to a nap. I am so positive on this. Yeah, I actually, I like. I'm skeptical of the other things. So CDC data from 2015: 27,000 people in the U.S. died from falls uh, that were over the age of 65. Of those, we don't have great information on this. Some of those falls were people that uh, I think a fair percentage that were in place and were not able to get help in a timely manner, and that's why they. Why they died? Is why you gotta buy, pay the extra hundred bucks to the LTE version? If the inconvenience to the system is additional calls, if it works, like yeah. the fall detection works, and it waits one minute and it makes the call, and the only false positives of are in those scenarios where it's not some tech problem, give me the false positives because the number lies at a same. And I don't think it's even it. get to that point. It'll get to a point where it will pop up on your phone or give you an audible alert to let you. To ver confirm whether it is or is not um, a real fall and, and an injury. And it has to pass that threshold. It can't be like, oh, I dropped my watch out the window. Right. And, and so from it's a tech perspective, the a modeling human. that they've done, they showed like three basic images of the different type of ways you can fall. But the modeling they do internally with, I'm sure, deep learning for what what the type of data, what type of accelerometer data, general data, they, what readings you get for a fall that only gets better over time. Yeah, and so we expect like more and more people buying these watches, this will get better. I'm super positive on this. And to, to sum up, like the watch isn't for us. The watch, they made a pitch today for older people <laughs> to buy money. these watches. I mean, no doubt. That, I mean, I, we, you laugh, but I think it's true. I don't know. that Their advertisement, which was... You know, all ages had people exercising and do, doing workout and riding a bike. I'm going to give my kid an Apple Watch, and I'll know if he's been bullied at school. <laughs> I'm but actually would you push down in, in daycare today. I mean, I, my I, parents are over eighty. I would buy them a watch. Now. No, I'm with you on that. I think it's great for them. But but the advertisement I thought showed some people. What was interesting was they showed some people uh, having accidents. You know, and like a guy riding his bike, and you see him hit something. He's going for a terrible fall. They don't show the aftermath of that fall or even the fall itself. They don't even explain that the watch, what the watch does in that case. They just show that, and it's kind of it's kind of striking. It's not like a, like a beautiful biking scene. That One you step expect. closer to Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. I'm going to pay the extra fee for have the Apple Care medical care. Oh wow, that person That's that right. person paid the twenty five dollars a month fee for to get the ambulance. Back, yeah, I, back away, back away. Yeah, <laughs> Apple Care <laughs> is here to help you. Uh, that is amazing. I've never thought about Apple Care in that context. We didn't talk about the haptic feedback. The digital crown now has haptic feedback in it, which you kind of blew off. Like, what, what, what could you really do? No, I was wondering what haptic feedback they could include in the I, crown. I think a lot of people probably blow this off. This is actually, I don't know, because I'm a haptics feedback nerd. I'm excited about this. Um, I, I love the idea of that having uh, simulated detents. With, it's what they call the, the, the like clicks that you get in a rotary encoder, like a dial. Da, 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 da. I love the idea of being able to add that to the, to the system or to games or whatever I'm using. Games? I don't play games on the watch. I don't know why I said that. But let's say Slack. Yeah, you know. All right. Notifications. Of yeah, some kind. notifications, exactly. Yeah, which is what, what this kind of haptic slash taptic feedback is all about. So uh, poll in the room. Do we have two Apple Watch users currently? Um, oh, yeah. This is, this is the only thing I'm buying from Apple this year. You're, you're doing it. Wow. So oh, you yeah. are, no, you no are in that camp where three, every three and a half years I've, you, will, you will spend that $500 to buy a new watch. I mean, yeah, I can't even get the new OS. I, you know, I, you should be proud of me for not getting one last year. I mean, I, you know, I have a, an, a, tech, a tech addiction. So the form factor is, is the big thing. The form factor happy about that. is, is the, the new signifier that it's a new model, new generation. Yeah. And, and uh, that plus all the internal benefits. I do not need cellular. I always have my phone. You're not a, you're not a runner. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. I know. It's hard you to tell. You could be boosted boarding. Boosted boarding. It's hard to tell. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I think they, the fact that they raised the price, that's, that says confidence to me. Yeah. That they went up in price, and we will quickly know if they misjudged the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they didn't the, with iPhone X. They, they, you're, you're right. But the, the amount of t- how much attention time and energy you put in your phone as a daily computing device, as a minute-to-minute computing device versus the watch, yeah. I think that is a, is a, it's a big gulf between mm-hmm. that. And if, I guess if the economy is doing well and people are affluent enough, they'll sell enough of these to make a business. Hey, no ceramic model mentioned. No gold, twenty-four karat model. No. It is at the at its peak about a th- thousand dollar watch that you will use for maybe three three to four years. I mean, there's the Hermes model if you want to spend some money. It's, it's Hermes. Sorry, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're going to move on <laughs> to the uh, the iPhone, the other half of uh, this week's Apple press conference. Uh, all the rumors were true. All the rumors. Did they uh, did they get all the names right? All the rumors they got the, the names. I believe. I mean, this morning they leaked. Yeah, they leaked in the in the the site map. Yeah. Of Apple, which is like, they they, they got to have a better security system. You know, just last week there was a, a book from uh, Ken. I forget the guy's last name. One of the one of the original Apple engineers for the iPhone, mm. uh, ex Apple employee now, who wrote a book about working on the first iPhone, and he designed the keyboard. He was a a coder who worked the UI expert to design the, the first widely used digital keyboard and he described in some of the excerpts describes the um the security measures and it's a re- we've heard about all this sure. before with the, the wallaby uh, prototype the tethered prototypes and but even in apple campus they couldn't use the code names uh in, in the cafeteria um that they would have to get in behind the, the multiple doors but it's notoriously secure there yeah i guess unless it's a day of launch and you have the, the sitemap data today uh, so uh iphone 10 is retired the iPhone 10. Sure, in this you way. can't buy it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Which makes it, it, it's is this the first time they've done that where the flagship phone? Yeah, it's usually less. You know, they usually keep it. Usually they keep it and push it down. Uh, they didn't mention the seven or the eight until the very end, right? So they announced three quote unquote new iPhones. Let's start at the very high end, replacing at the thousand dollar level, which they have proven is. Of a viable market, they can sell a thousand dollar plus phone. Is the iPhone 10 S mm-hmm. and the iPhone 10 S in a new form factor, a larger form factor, the iPhone 10 S Max? Okay, so thousand dollars for 64 gigabytes goes up to 512 gigabytes or eleven hundred dollars for the 10 X Max, uh, which also starts at 64 gigabytes and goes up to 512 gigabytes, half a terabyte on your phone at its highest price. It would be fourteen hundred and fifty dollars before tax. Uh, you lucky Oregonians who don't have state sales tax. Um, so a fifteen hundred dollar phone for your, for the new flagship iPhone. New form factor. What's different? Well, six point five inch screen. It's basically the plus model equivalent for the iPhone. Um, and while the iPhone, we all know, five point eight inch screen, right, of the iPhone ten. Yep. The it's bigger than five point five inch of what the eight plus or seven plus. But it's bigger in a different way. It's diagonally. It's more. It's it's longer. Sure. But it's a. It's still a slimmer form factor. Okay. So a lot of people are still wanted. They wanted the text rendering, the point pixel rendering uh, of the eight plus, uh, and this is what they might get with the iPhone XS Max, which is same aspect ratio as the ten, but now stretched out, six point five inches, still OLED screen. Face ID, it looks like just a larger iPhone 10. So we're going to call it the iPhone Tennis, right? Tennis. Nice. Tennis, right? Yeah. Good job. Better than XS, right? I'm, I'm yes. glad they got away from the XS because it is excessive. So what's new about the Tennis? Well, uh, it's, it's a hot new processor. It's a seven mil, uh, nanometer I, I, processor. I think, yeah, the, the updates are in two big things. Although they did talk about the screen, they said it's better HDR. I don't. Better color for the it's, it's OLED screen. It's the, the OLED screen is great from last year's exactly. model. Exactly. The Tennis like, is amazing. It's diminishing returns on the screen for sure. Uh, two things, processor and camera. Processor, first, they spent a huge amount of time, half an hour, on just the processor, A12 Bionic processor, the first now in a seven nanometer manufacturing process. This is the first consumer seven nanometer pr- pro- uh, product, right? Yeah, I think TSMC- Is it the first? Because Huawei announced it earlier this year. But, but the first one to be sold. Ah, uh, gotcha. In, in, in these quantities, uh, we're still lagging behind on both GPU and CPU side, 10 nanometer, 
for, for those. Uh, 70 nanometer makes a lot of sense for the phones. If it means more power efficiency, instead of getting more battery life, because battery life is not dramatically improved on these phones, half an hour more, hour and a half more on the big one. Same with the watch. Same with the right. watch, exactly. It's, it's a trend where they rather devote those efficiencies to performance and being able to do more on the phones than to be able to use them And in the watch, longer. slimming we, it down a little bit. We should issue a cautionary note. Like, this isn't seven nanometers in the way we think about processors in our desktops. No. No, this is like a totally different, like, construction process. And it's a way sort of to like try a to push on yeah. Moore's Law. Seven nanometer equivalent, we yeah. can call it that, with, uh, with various layers of production processes that the yields of for which, you know, they have to reach a certain benchmark for them to make money from this or else... Uh, they can't, or maybe they bend the chips, and those other chips, the failed chips, goes in other products. You looked at know. a Wikipedia link about seven nanometer. It looks like it was uh, the first single transistor seven nanometer processes were being done almost twenty years ago. Yeah, but it took now this length of time before we finally get consumer products made that way. Single transistor. Yeah, a lot more than that. <laughs> I mean, orders and orders and orders of magnitude. How? More, I mean, my God, like here. they said, last year's phone could do eight hundred billion processes a second, and this new processor can do what? One point something. No, no, no. Like no five, trillion. Oh, five trillion. Five trillion. Holy cow! What? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're split in a couple ways. Like that that number is. It is weighted in a certain way, right? It's it's uh, at certain efficiencies with certain processes. Six cores, you know, four low power cores, two high performance cores. They the GPU gets better and better over time for these things, uh, and of course they have you know uh, built into it also their Face ID security enclave and all, all the other stuff. What do, what do you think about the neural engine that's going to be smartly moving processes to the to the right uh, system? I mean that's that's. I mean that already important. exists, but yeah. I think like to, for a power efficiency, yeah. that's where they're getting it. Hmm. You yeah. think they save some battery life that way. Yeah, that that's what I think. Otherwise, yeah. I'm like, where is that battery life coming from? It's not just coming from the seven nanometer thing. Most of the apps you're going to use, if you're using your standard stock apps, your killer apps right now, are not going to tax this this processor. So it's a challenge for any phone company to try to show the killer apps that do take advantage the third party apps that will take advantage of this. And the fear is how you don't want an app developer to create something that will segment the market. Now, anyone designing for iOS, you're probably in, in, in good company if you build to take advantage of this processor because you know tens, if not you know, millions of people will have this new phone in the coming months. Uh, but you also want to tap into the wider iOS market as a whole, the App Store market as a whole. So they brought up three developers. Uh, Bethesda showed a new uh, Elder Scrolls game. That was actually debuted at E3. It looked okay. Yeah, it's, it's fine. The neat thing about that game, he didn't, Todd Howard didn't go into it, but it's actually a cross-platform game. So it's going to be available on PC, even in VR, yeah. and you'll be able to play with people who are playing on the phone. They, but they, I mean, this, is, this was them not having Fortnite. And right. you, you can play like either way. Like it's a really flexible app, and it seems like you can play it in a number of ways. It, it, it's like, um, what was that hack and slash game that Epic made? Um, Infinity Blade. Infi it's like Infinity this Blade. This is what's called Blades. <laughs> it's called Elder Scroll Blades. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've come a long way from Infinity Blade with the, the uh, quick time event style combat, and now it's a full blown RPG. I mean, yeah. Let's give it credit. The game did look good. It looks it's good. just not impressive from a gameplay. And no, it looks like a distraction. But I, it, felt, I felt like in back channels, they probably reached out to Epic because to have Fortnite up there would have been the statement. Fortnite, you know, phone equivalent performance better than console performance or the same or if not better experience. And instead they got another class cross-platform thing that yeah. some people would be excited for but doesn't have that mass appeal. I mean, for, if, for if they could have reserved the announcement of Fortnite for this event, that would have been the announcement of the event. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, and then the other two were, I think, also interesting, both AR. Uh, one, a sports-based app. And they listen to the language of this. So interesting. It's an app that already is out already. And what's going to be available with this is an update that will allow multiple processes that previously weren't available, uh, including the real-time tracking for players and, and, and um, shot prediction and that kind of stuff. Uh, I would take all that with a grain of salt because I don't, I'm not, I don't trust all that modeling right now. You know, it's all the video, body vi tracking. Yeah, and it's stuff. all kind of like video gamey. Like you're going to still get much better results with real trackers um, on the people and on the ball. And uh, this 
I don't think the computer vision is, is quite there. It yet. was weird because the camera was, which is supposed to be a phone, was clearly locked down on some kind of tripod. How yep. often is that going to be the case? I, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It's better than having a laptop. No, sure. Right? Yeah, but I guess you got to come with your Gorilla Pod and get yeah. it set up correctly. Yeah. And the, the player was really far away. Like, yeah. we were wondering, like, is it possible they're using IR to, like, do some sort of connect style? They think it's, skull, I mean, they said skeletal modeling, basically, with just, it's just Give, Given the distance video. and the fact that it's probably the other, that camera, there's no IR blaster on mm -hmm. that side. I, I bet you're right. I bet it all, it's all just like optical. Which is why I don't think it's going to be that impactful as, as a metric. It's going to be fun to see, and yeah. I'm sure they can they can have modeling that will show where uh, a basketball might land, but I don't think it's going to – like the, the physics model has to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Or that's actually be meaningful. It was, a, it was a compelling demo, though. Like I felt like that product, that, that experience could be a product in and of itself that basketball players would buy. But it's just I think a, it's novelty. It's just an app. I think it's a novelty. It's a novelty if it doesn't work great. But if it works well, it could be pretty great. Yeah, and they're banking on it, right? There's a lot of money in sports. Yep. And and, uh, and then the third one uh, was Galaga. games. Yes, VR. I hate the way he talked about how this was going to be like an arcade. It's not an arcade. It's not the arcade experience. I'm like, Jeremy is so excited. He's so excited. Nope. It's just kind of like through the phone AR Galaga. They had like an arcade game pop up out of augmented out of the table and everyone crowded around it and I thought they were all going to play exactly, Galaga. Exactly, right? Play the the game. Yeah. No. But uh, but then like if they had done that, we would be sitting here saying all they they didn't think outside the box. They didn't do anything interesting. Right, right. I, I mean if Magic Leap could have had Galaga as at a launch as a launch title, that would be pretty neat, like aiming with your controller and shooting things. I, what's cool about this is it demonstrates the multi-user single augmented reality experience experience. And how is that connected? Is it Bluetooth? Is that local Wi-Fi? Like what is what is that connection yeah. between the phones to to sync that all up? It's an iOS 12 feature, uh, and it, it's so it's not limited to the new phones. That is something that no AR device currently does or does well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so local I'm, shared and, and wearable or, or phone based. Yeah, is local shared AR. This is where you have potential for tabletop gaming being this, a that, big thing. That Jerry Ellsworth experiment that she, yes. that she kickstarted years ago. Right, right, Th right. This is cast that, AR. That, yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't think Galaga is, is what I care about. I, 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 <laughs> this is one where I want the phone to be locked on the table and have shared AR information and, and you know um, asynchronous yeah. AR information. I see certain things, you see certain things, but we're all seeing it pop up on the same but synchronized. tape. But synchronized. Dude, there's a, there's serious good games involved there. But, yeah. but, but different information. I get I you. see my characters, totally. you see your characters, we all see the same map. Battleship. Your fog of war is built in. There you go. Right? And that's where a lot, beyond, Gaug is the first step. It's, it's I guess it's appropriate in that sense. It's the very first type of game you would make with this technology. Yeah. Let's get to pandemic we are talking game about a fifteen hundred dollar phone and we're talking about galaga well first of all you'll be able to do this I on, love on last year's phones but or the new we didn't mention the new phones yet like the cheap yeah, ones yeah so but, but just to finish this ar okay. talk what you really want are the glasses like watching that you don't yeah. want to hold the phone like you just want to be able to see the stuff so listen to their verbiage they get, said ar a big thing they're banking a lot on I know. they bought that that, that waveguide company last uh last month let's get there the, we uh, eventually and and it builds a confidence that whenever we do get there, they will be far and away ahead of the competition in terms of support and platform and user experience and... Dev preparation. Uh, dev prep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's all a question of what the headset and the interface and the controller looks like now and, and pricing, of course. What would you pay? Let's let's a random tangent. If they put out a Magic Leap style headset with this type <laughs> of game support and dev support, name your price. The steel model or the aluminum model? Let's go aluminum model. Oh, God. I have no idea, man. I have no idea. I, I, you know it's going to be expensive. What if, it, what if it runs off the power of your phone? So it's just display. This is what the speculation is. Lightning cable from your phone, battery off, com computation off your phone. Maybe there's a battery on the headset itself. It, if it's AR that works, like, you know, five, five to 700. Ooh, I think it's, it's going to be generous. twice that. At least. I know it's going to be twice yeah. that. I don't know. But you asked what I would pay. Yeah. No. So you're third, third gen, third gen buyer. When that gets trickled down, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying what I would pay because <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I would be. Do you accept children for payment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. The uh, the other uh, big flagship feature is new camera, uh, photos. Killer app. Messaging and photos are the two big killer things on phones, of course, first party. And uh, new camera system, Phil Schiller talked extensively about two camera system, of course. Uh, now both 12 megapixel. 
Now, bigger, bigger actual sensors, so better low light performance. Hmm. Um, these are Aperture 1.4, and um, and you know, with the new processor, they'll do a lot of computational photography behind the scenes to make your photos look great. The new software feature, now this wasn't indicated whether this would be on the current phones or just new phones, is that you can actually adjust the depth of field effect in portrait mode. The f-stop. Third-party apps have already let you do exactly, that. Exactly, on current gen phones. Yeah, and but what's most interesting to me is that they actually show the f-stop number, which to me feels like a very un-Apple-like thing. Like, I, hmm. I totally see them doing a slider, mm -hmm. but to associate that with an equivalent for a, a digital camera lens, um, which they didn't say was this is a full-frame equivalent, this is a, a crop sensor equivalent for f-414 to, to f-12, like, to have that really... It, it, that was definitely, I think, a point of discussion I, internally for them. I'm not surprised, though, because the camera is consistently one of their selling points. So you figure they have to do some education about this, what, regardless of what the user experience. And how, like. how wonderful is that as, as an educational element? Because yeah. now a user can, in real time, see what the difference between f-stops actually has. But the f-stops, it, it, it's... My point is that it, it, they're different depending on the type of sensor and lens. Like, yeah, I, I understand, but but the, the user who is this, so at, say, at this well, level of like newbiness, but they'll they'll associate that with they're not going to memorize the numbers. They're just going to know that lower, lower number means blurrier, and, and lower numbers mean blurrier, yeah. smoother, uh, and higher. And and this is something that I've been talking about for a long time in terms of the the uh, the growing complexity of photo apps and the hidden complexity within the simplicity. Like Instagram has done so much to get people accustomed to fixing and tweaking their photos mm. and, and, and incorporating them into a language of photo editing that five years ago would have been very obtuse uh, without the accessibility of something like Instagram. Like filters, whatever you think about filters, filters got people to think about photos way more seriously in a mass number. And that's, that's Apple's game, right? Like 10 years ago, people were happy with point and shoots and happy with, and, and megapixels were, were king. And now megapixels are an afterthought and people actually care about what, these f stops and and um, and and the size of sensors, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing. I mean, because when you're investing fifteen hundred dollars in a phone, you want to know what you're paying for. They talked about some new HDR um, features, which I'm happy about, just because I feel like HDR still is looks doesn't look great. Like whenever I turn HDR on my phone, it's by accident, and I get the phone, I get the results, and it's never right. Like the, the stuff that gets highlighted is way over you think it's exposed. I mean, part of it could be the display issue too, because HDR. "Quote unquote HDR photos on a non HDR." I'm phone looking screen. on my phone, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I'm just not happy with HDR. Yeah. So if they can improve that, and it, they made a point of saying they had, well, the thing they had improved specifically is the stitching of the photos and how the photos are taken, so that you don't get missed frames and you don't get muddled blurriness. So you don't get of motion exactly because when you do HDR, you're taking at least three shots, yeah. and on SLR, you know, traditionally that would have been over time. So you got you know, like you're underexposed and then you're normal and you're over, over the course of like a you know a quarter second or mm -hmm. less. Yeah, it shows very tough for moving moving. Exactly. So, so now Apple's saying that they are taking all of them simultaneously, and more than just three. As right? simultaneous as they can. Oh, that's because the, they have two lens. They have two sensors. Okay. Great, but but it, like the demos that they showed of that water flying through the air, that yeah. looked pretty pretty sharp. Yeah, and and computational photography is it's the reality. It's what they have to do. I, I mean, it's something that. I wish the Sonys and the Canons and Nikons in the world invested more in, mm. um, but because of the physical limitation of what you have on the camera on a phone, this is what Apple has to do, and they have, that's why they have a world-class imaging team, and it is, it's why people care about their... It's why you can be on the cover of Time Magazine, as, as Phil said. Uh, all right, newest phone, the big surprise, not real big surprise, uh, but the reason the iPhone ten is retired is because it's going to be replaced with a new entry-level... Uh, Entry level iPhone 10, it's the 10R. Mm -hmm. 10R. Yeah. All right. XR. And this is a middle of the road size phone. It's bigger than the iPhone 10, smaller than the, the 10 ma Max. This must be a manufacturing thing, is so, what it struck me as. Is there must be some scale they optimize. So, so wait, the, the screen is smaller. But no, screen is bigger. The screen is bigger? 6.1 inches. 5.8, 6.1, 6.5. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. But lower de pixel density. Hmm. 
like 320 still. So it's still Retina. Still Retina, not the 400 and something no, no. that you have in the 10. And it's LCD. And then this, this reminded me of the 5C launch so much, right? Remember the 5C launch, the candy-coated yeah. back color yeah. launch? Plastic. plastic. Plastic is so wonderful after a steel, glass, steel, mm. glass. And now they're like, OLED, OLED, OLED. Yeah. LCD is so wonderful. The best LCD screen on a, on a, on a phone. Unapologetically LCD. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think people are gonna like this phone. One because it's seven hundred fifty dollars, two a quarter of the price, a quarter, three quarters the price of the ten S. Side by side, you really see the OLED difference, but without it side by side, I think for LCDs most people it's fine. fine. Especially what? anyone who has a seven or eight. Especially at the price point, like at that price. That point, makes you know. a big difference. So the, what's the really differentiator then? And, and it's bigger, right? Like a lot of those people are like, "What? I can pay two hundred and fifty dollars less and get a bigger phone, even though it's fewer pixels." And with good battery life. And the new processor. And the new processor. This, I was surprised it was a new processor. And I think it's new processor because they want to have parity for the developers. They want developers to not feel like they're only making stuff for the $1,000 plus market. And right. you're going to still have a lot of people with the XR. I wonder if there's some iOS features that need to take advantage of that processor, too, that are down the pipe. Mm. And so having split, you know... Hmm. Um, you, you know, lack of in cohesion across it. I don't think it's it an economy of scale manufacturing thing too, because they're still making the the old the A11, A10 for um, or at least A10 for the, the iPhone 8 and 7, which they're still selling. Uh, but this one has a new processor, and one camera is really the biggest differentiator. I think LCD is going to be less impactful for most people, but the single camera system is it the same camera as the 8? It is a, no, the same wide angle as the 10s. Oh, so they took one of the cameras from the 10. And not the telephoto. Interesting. But with that wide angle, they're still adding in bokeh. But not in the same way. What do you mean? It supports portrait mode? It supports a software-based portrait mode using depth map that they get from a single camera. Huh. I'm not sure if it's for movement. I don't know exactly how they're doing it. Huh. And think of the, the, even the bigger difference is this is a wide angle portrait mode. Yeah. Whereas portrait mode on the 10 and the 10s and the, even the, the the eight and seven it forces you it forces you to jump into that about 50 millimeter uh, equivalent huh so okay will that feature will that wide angle portrait mode be available on the 10s don't know oh right like can you zoom right? out can you cool. and how good is that portrait mode the examples they showed i could tell a little more feathering between the, the foreground and the background those edges where it gets a little um, fuzzy blurry yeah but I, I think they know that portrait mode is compelling it works for Instagram works for Facebook people like the look of it and when portrait mode works it's magic the fact that I can shoot a, a photo that is it's good enough exactly that yeah. gives me that kind of depth of field on a phone even if it's artificial and Phil Schiller used a, a term today that I'd never heard computational photography he says a lot of people are calling it this I'd never heard it but I oh, like Jeremy it I said it like yeah 15 Norm minutes ago, it he said it. I've said it on the podcast. I like it. I'm on board with that term now. It, it, it's, it's basically, it, it, it's not mutually exclusive to physical like lenses, yeah. but it is something that compensates for not being able to avoid the physics of small phones and small sensors and small lenses. Uh, and the thing I wish is that other companies would have the R&D to embrace computational ph photography with using full-frame DSLR lenses and sensors because that's missing in, what do you mean on the like end. using both yeah using both oh man that would be very powerful yes right that would solve a lot of the and and i feel like this is where camera companies on the high end maybe rest on their laurels a little bit or they can't afford the r d that apple puts into their imaging team gentlemen we've made it to the end without being as snarky as most of the internet was about this presentation <laughs> but i do think we should talk briefly about what was disappointing because this was on some level a less exciting apple announcement compared to years past it's always reading between the lines yeah I mean, the, 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 the the critical way to watch any of these press conferences is try to read between the lines what is not said and what are they saying why are they saying the things they're saying and i think it was clear from all of us that from the phone side this was a stopgap year this was, one, an acknowledgement on the internally that people are willing to pay a lot for these new phones, so hence the up to $1,500 phone, but also uh, an acknowledgement that they kind of messed things up a little bit with the lineup last year with the 8 and then the 10. There is no there 9 this year. There just so many skews yeah. last year. Now, it's, yeah. now the, the 10R is kind of like the 9. That's weird. Tennis and 10R. Tennis and 10R? Like tenor. Like a, tenor. Yeah. Tenor and tennis. And they 
kept the entry level phones as the seven and the eight as their 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 entry level phones. Uh, but that means that there's porch remote across the entire lineup now. Well, that that's great actually. So. Uh, these phones, uh, the R comes out later in the year, and the Tennis and the Tennis Max come out uh, in, later this month. So the 6S is, is gone. They yeah. officially do not sell a phone with a headphone jack. Mm-hmm. And not said oh, yeah. is that the dongle that uh, previously was included with all their fo- Lightning-only phones, the dongle for 3.5 to Lightning, is no longer for free. At the that was one of my key product. disappointments. Yeah. And the other disappointment I have is just sort of generally zoomed out we only got two products like i mean we could talk about how many phones they talked about the watch and the phone yeah but we just got the watch and the phone nothing yeah. ipad nothing macbook not even the weren't there macbook rumors last week there were there yeah. are two big rumors that didn't weren't fulfilled one was an entry-level macbook to replace the macbook air in a macbook form factor and the other was a new ipad pro that the, the, the weird rumor was that it was going to have a USB-C connection as opposed to a Lightning connection, and uh, this we could this could be one of those things where they got the feedback from the press about that, or or they 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 read the tea leaves and pulled that from the announcement in the last minute. I'm surprised we didn't hear anything about Air Power because it's been a year since they announced that. That was the other thing. And, Huge disappointment. And now Nine to Five Mac is reporting they may not even make it this year. To market with that thing. Wow, that's over a year late. This is the charging pad that charges three things at once. Do you ever think we could have an iPhone without any ports if air power works? Like, think about that. Like, mm-hmm. no lightning cable, no headphone jack, no. nothing. Then no. we could have a sealed phone. No. Okay. It would be very slow charging. Uh, no doubt. There's <laughs> some <laughs> CarPlay. Uh, until Apple sells that. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. But th- then, then Apple will have to sell a pad that fits in your car that plugs over lightning yeah. and you have wireless data and power. Can I get one thing off my chest that really bugged me? Do it. So Lisa Ann Jackson usually comes up there and does like the, here's how Apple supporting the environment. Uh, and that's nice. She talked about recycled tin in the phone. Mm-hmm. I just want to say that's not what matters. What matters here is like the word, the three words you should look out for okay. if they actually are serious about, about recycling is cadmium, cobalt and lithium. We until we hear those words, it like recycling doesn't matter because w- there's no tin shortage in this in this world. Cadmium is being mined out of uh, cadmium and cobalt are being mined out of the Congo, and there's a lot of conflict that has been arisen from mining those rare earth metals. And we think there's a, a depletion of those in the earth, so those are kind of big deals. So I until they do that, or at least stop gluing the battery down, so people can recycle this wherever. Uh, I'm not sold on this recycling. Yeah, that's a bigger point is let, let people repair their phones, please. Or, I mean, even recycle them themselves. Um, why she, do why do I need Apple to To be fair, what phone? was her name? Lisa? She, mm. she acknowledged that this was the tip of the iceberg and that they were embarking totally. on this, being able to recycle everything in the phone, use renewables throughout the phone. So it's going to take time. They didn't yes. answer that every Apple campus in the world is now powered so, using renewable energy, which is cool. No, no, I don't mean to criticize the whole enterprise. It was just like until we hear those words, yeah. it, like we aren't to the level we need to be at. Noted. Um, no, I, I'm with you on just overall. This was the biggest meh September Apple announcement I think I could remember. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here that's likable, but nothing that like really blows you away. And and I we were talking a little bit about this, Norm, is that. You could see that they were trying to be excited, <laughs> that they were doing their job, and they were up on stage talking about how magical the day was, and you just you know they didn't b- believe it. Like they're more excited about next year. They just can't. Tell well, they anymore. know, right? And yeah. that's the worst part, right? Because they even work. They they need these phones to sell just as actually better than they did last year, and that's the place they're in. They've put they put themselves in a very enviable position of having a trillion dollar company yeah. and <laughs> needing not being complacent with selling, you know, uh, the same amount of phones they did last year. Growth. It's a it's a terrible and harsh harsh business to be in. All right. Uh, before I think that's are we done with the, the done. Apple event, the top story this week? Before done. we move on to our next segment, I want to thank these other sponsor of this week's episode and that's 
Evident. Evidence is revolutionizing the way personal data is shared. Evident provides a simple, secure platform that lets businesses confidently know who they're dealing with without handling sensitive personal data. With connections to thousands of authoritative sources through a single API, Evident is the only platform that enables comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date identity and credential verifications. Companies can create a solid foundation of trust and safety on their platform, allowing them to seamlessly verify workers in less time and with more confidence. Evident is bringing confidence and peace of mind to personal data interactions across the globe, verify anything without risk and expense of handling sensitive personal data, and check out evident.com slash test to sign up and get started immediately. Again, that's evident ID, sorry, evidentid.com slash test to sign up and start running verifications in minutes, E-V-I-D-E-N-T-I-D.com slash test, and thank them for sponsoring this week's episode. Did we go an hour on Apple? We, I think we did. Holy cow. Half, that's half the length of the keynote. I'm or the, so, sorry. Press conference. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. All right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's that time in <laughs> September. That time of the year. Okay. How many people do you think watch that live stream? A, a lot. Now you can watch it on Chrome. Right, right. You could watch it on Twitter. Anywhere. Yep. What was the point of gating it oh, before, previously for Safari? Yeah. Ugh. Hey, let's talk about phones again, guys. What about them? Well, the Pixel 3 is set to unveil October 9th. <laughs> what are you doing? Hey, hey, you hey in, sure. We're, 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 we're in, we're in, we're in, in pop, pop culture, culture I don't even know where we are because I'm like, <laughs> it's been an hour. Are we on tech news yet? All right. All right. Okay. Uh, the big <laughs> pop culture news that just dropped this morning is Henry Cavill may be out as Superman. Uh, the bad guy from Mission Impossible? That, that's right. The bad guy from Mission Impossible huh. may no longer be playing Superman. Um, this is causing much turmoil in the pop culture, pop culture fan community, as I think regardless of what you thought about the films, I think everyone agreed Henry Cavill was a wonderful Superman from Man of Steel to Batman v Superman, he even Justice League. He was a good type of Superman, that kind of austere, didn't, didn't show much emotion kind of Superman. Uh, and he looked the part. Yeah, he abs- absolutely looked the part. Um and uh, this is after he was just announced as committing to the Netflix show for the TV show based on the game, The Witcher. Okay. Um, which I think was well received as, as casting news goes. Uh, the Warner Brothers has come out and said there's nothing official to announce yet. They had a great relationship with Henry Cavill and his people and, and uh, nothing has changed. But uh, This I, feels like a contract dispute it, to it, me. If, well, that and also I think just some uh, internal reckoning in WB in realizing that Justice League clearly did not perform as well as they had hoped. And the whole build up to that from that Zack Snyder shepherded that he then was released from, um, you know, that, that whole regime has changed, which is weird because you have two movies coming out, you know, one in post production, one shooting. Um, in that world, Wonder Woman 1984 and Aquaman later this year, and also in development, the Ezra Miller Flash movie. So, and also, this is on the tales of the uh, the Matt Reeves Batman film may not be starring Ben Affleck. So, how do you have a shared universe where half the characters are from one part of it and half the characters are new actors recasted? Like, is this I, I, this is business as usual for Hollywood, but in this new world where you have the standard, the gold standard of the MCU being that's, so consistent. That's the problem, is that that's the standard. People have an expectation now. The fans have an expectation. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, they built up to Justice League with a bunch of bad movies and then delivered a terrible movie. And so what do you expect? Like, the like uh, Batman v Superman, appreciably bad. Mm-hmm. Suicide Squad, one of the worst superhero movies ever made. Oh, wow. I should see that. It's not good. Justice League continued that trend. So I, I think this is just a, the reckoning that I would expect from movies that aren't good. Yeah. I mean, wh- who wouldn't be more excited about a reboot <laughs> than, than the, a, you know, part three or whatever of a Superman movie? I think fans are f- kind of fickle. I remember when uh, they announced... Um, the uh, Man of Steel movie, when they first announced Henry Cavill as an actor, yeah. 
there were people at Comic Con, casual fans, mm-hmm. who were just like, "What happened to Tom Welling? They wanted the the the, the Superboy they knew from the Smallville series to be Superman, hmm. and people get attached to these actors because they represent in their head a fulfillment of the the character and ideal, and any and." You know, Marvel hasn't had to reckon with this. I think the only time they've had major casting was with Don Cheadle replacing Terrence Howard for you know, Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2. Um, and they briefly addressed that in, in movie, in the dialogue, and, and moved on past that. But it, this shakeup, like, which is business as usual. These things happen all the time. From a business perspective, it's their, within their rights to do this. And uh, just like in, you know, it, it's a difference between James Bond, I think, and comic book characters hmm. with james bond people are readily accept a new actor like this is just the, the mantle it's the, the mythology of the character how did they accept that at first though when you first got roger moore were the fans up in arms i know my mom never accepted him yeah she always wanted sean connery back that and, and i wasn't there for that and i i, I guess it, in the modern era the the uh, franchises had to die down before there had to be a lull before you had the new casting, right? Goldeneye and, and, and uh, Pierce Brosnan, that ran its course, and you felt like, eh, these movies aren't so great anymore, and then it, they, these, they get reinvigorated with new casting, new directors, and for comic book heroes, these are sudden changes. I guess the most uh, recent there's comparison only is one, Spider-Man. There's only one DC character that can't be recast, yeah. and that's Gal Gadot. That's right. That's it. Everyone else doesn't matter to me. Wow. And I bet most of the fans feel that way too. Even though people really like Ezra Miller, I think we deal fine. He has he's only appeared in that one movie. I think everyone is touchable here. I don't think we need that is not Superman the right movie. phrasing. I don't. Th- <laughs> no, it's not. I don't think we need a new Superman movie. I think that's a it's a tired character. Give I think it, yeah. Given how much money they've spent on it and the stories they were trying to tell, not as interesting these days. Well, he's the best DC character they got. Batman's the best so DC character. Eventually, they got. I don't. I disagree. I like Superman more because I grew up with that 1978 or whatever Superman. Uh, I would say you know, he'll he'll be back. Just let it rest. Ooh, all right, uh, and we'll we'll see. I mean, is this in the world of casting? Is this a tougher break than if they had been forced to recast Kirk? Because of y- you reported contract negotiation disputes. You mean for, for, the, for the, the new ones? Yeah. <laughs> what are they talking about? Specific people? I, no. Okay. I don't know. I mean, Pine is it Pine? Chris Pine. Chris Pine. Pine. Yeah. yeah, he's good. He's good. I don't know. I'm not. I'm yeah. open to new Kirks though. Yeah. It's it's it's. I mean, we talked about with Spock too. It's a big deal when they cast new actors in iconic roles because so much of the and and same with Christopher Reeve and Superman. Right. So much of what we remember about the character, the actor becomes interwoven with. The, the fabric of the character. And uh, you want the new actors to embody at least some of that. I bet studios hate that. They you know? do. Cause they, they want to give any power to the actors. Because they just want to own the IP. They, like, don't, yeah. they don't want to have to deal with actual people. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, they, don't want, they don't want the people to have any ownership over these characters. No, no. But that's, that's not how it works uh, in, in the mind of the audience and fans. And in some cases, it is. And it, that's what the funny thing about, about fandom. Um, speaking of... Uh, uh, other things of fandom. One thing that we're big fans of the serial podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you listen to seasons one, season two? Just one. Just season one. All right. In this edition, Norm and Jeremy discuss the return of serial. <laughs> boop 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 boop. I can't even do it. Mail Sarah Kenning. Kemp. Mail Kemp. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited for it to come back. Season three of Serial. From This American Life, I can't uh, believe we're, we're doing this. This is crazy that a podcast was is so popular that it's in our pop culture section. It is uh, not going to be a full season dedicated to one story. It's going to be about the Cleveland court system and um, individual stories broken down maybe two to three episodes. Although, because it's in the Cleveland court system, there's a chance for things to maybe to inter- interwoven, to use a pop culture parlance, uh, a connected universe of real, real true stories. Who knows? Uh, I, I'm excited to listen to it. Okay, great. I, I just don't know if this this format. I don't think any aside from like S Town. I don't think any other kind of narrative podcast, real investigative podcast series has captured pop culture the way Serial did. No, yeah. not at all. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, the Academy Awards, the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences, mm-hmm. uh, has rescinded. Uh, uh, its take on um, having a new category for popular 
movie. Oh, they did they? And they're going to put that <laughs> idea on hold based on <laughs> feedback and and rethink it. <laughs> feedback. So uh, th- I, I c- would consider that a good thing. And in the wake of that, uh, Disney has said they were going to put a lot of energy and, and money behind the campaign for Black Panther mm. to, f- to be nominated in numerous categories, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, um, Best uh, Original Song. So they had Infinity War and Black Panther out in the same year, right? Does, that's not, that's what feels weird, doesn't it? And, so, and they're pushing Black Panther. Yeah, oh, be, I, easily. well, easily. Yeah. Like Infinity War is an ensemble film. Like who do we who do you put up for yeah, like yeah. acting awards in that kind of movie? I loved Black Panther, but I'm just saying that Infinity War was a big was a more important film for them because it, it drew together all the Marvel films. It's a more important film to me, but I think Black Panther is the more important film uh, because it. I think it what it what Black Panther did was really truly break the ground that Marvel can tell stories about any character they want mm-hmm. and and really build a universe uh that people respond to uh and so i i i think black panther there's a couple acting performances in it that i could see um rise up i would be interested in, i don't think that's michael b jordan's best performance in a movie by any stretch what do you think it is is it creed creed yeah creed or fruit bell like Hey, guess what? They're all they're all <laughs> Ryan Coogler. Maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe director. I think director is is right. The word that oh, but costuming too, and like you know, there's all those other categories that I think Black Panther has a lot to um, be nominated for. I don't know about effects. That doesn't strike me as like a big effects movie. I though. agree. Yeah, um, but I'd, I'd love to see it nominated, and uh, I'm glad there's no popular film category. A uh, little more detail on the Patrick Stewart, Jean Luc Picard. TV show in the works at CBS. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, on the writing team is Michael Shabon, and he posted on Instagram uh, a confirmation of the, the time that would be set in. For 20 years later, yep. after Nemesis, sets it in 2399. Okay, but you knew this already, right? We didn't know the exact year. Well, yeah, but you knew it was 20 years after Nemesis. Right, but th- I think 2399 is important because... Oh. Thematically, it could uh, one of the themes of the show could be the ushering out of the 24th century and laying the groundwork for what it means for Star Trek to exist in the 25th century. Okay, because we had TOS era, which has always been it was 23rd uh, century, and Next Gen, Voyager, DS9 was all within that kind of third 20, 30 year period in the 24th century, and now this could be pushing Star Trek into the 25th century. So even beyond Voyager. Is what you're oh yeah, way 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 beyond Voyager. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. Voyager is right at the tail end. Hmm. I mean, it's all like we had you know 21 seasons of Star Trek, kind of within that same time bracket, within that two two decade. Uh, Do you think they're going to use it to set up the future? Yes, that's what makes the most sense to me. Yeah, yeah. so I like going 20 years in, in advance. Then, if that's yeah. the goal, and and you know, for people who play Star Trek Online, they're freaking out like, what does this mean? Will it converge with Star Trek Online? No. Sorry, players. <laughs> though that continuity is not a uh, film canon. And, um, and, and and as much as as interesting as those storylines may have been, uh, what's on TV completely completely different. When are you hoping to be able to watch the Picard show? Oh gosh, end of year, beginning of next, next year? year? No, end of. Ne- I don't <laughs> no. think this year is even in the cards. No, not well, but it's going to be a short run, right? I expected like an eight episode run. I think it'll be next summer. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Next summer, next fall, another year. More likely, it'll be. A, I'll have a comic. Uh, I think. Star Trek Las Vegas, the Star Trek big Star Trek convention next year, we'll see the first footage. Oh wow, that'd be yeah. big for them. Yeah, yeah, and that makes the most sense. Uh, plus, you know, I th- in terms of the programming for CBS, they have Star Trek Discovery season two, which still needs to air and and still needs to have its full run week by week, uh, and then the multiple shows in development. Um, you know, you can, they don't have un- unlimited bandwidth to do unlimited shows, so th- they need this to keep people subscribing as well. It'll probably be after. After all that ends. So I bet at the end of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, we'll see our first teaser. Okay. For the Picard show. That's going to get people to stay on subscribing yep. for CBS All Access. Uh, while we don't have Star Trek, other Star Trek news, we have Black Mirror news with the, their episode, The USS Callister, highly inspired by Star Trek. And that is nominated, uh, won, sorry, won an Emmy for uh, Best Outstanding TV Movie. It was great. That was one of the best episodes of Black Mirror. That was the best episode of Black Mirror. Was it a sci-fi movie. episode? Yeah. Like on a spaceship? Did you Wait, not watch you it? you watched this? No. I haven't Wait, watched it. I've not watched Black Mirror once. 
This is the. Oh this is an God. incredible episode of, of Black. Jeremy, 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 Jeremy. They made a whole spaceship set for it. You need to go. Oh my. <laughs> No, hey, let's let's not overdo it. Let's right. o- not, right. not overdo it. You need Norm. to go home tonight, and you need to not not watch with your kids. Do, yeah, do yeah. not watch with your kids. Really? No. Nope. Okay. It's, it's, uh, never watch Black Mirror with no, your kids. No, it's, it's very unsettling. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, it's it's definitely dark dark themes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you need to watch this episode. This episode. This episode. All right. Wow. So you need you need to do it. Done. We've been watching actually. My my kid, my eleven year old, and I have been watching Twilight Zone and Hitchcock every night. We do one of each, and we say which one we like better. Hitchcock. But those are fun because they're similar in that they have... I'm Twilight Zone all the way. I don't know what you're talking about. No, Hitchcock is great, dude. No, I'm not saying Hitchcock's not great. I'm a Twilight Zone. Both of these shows have, uh, you know, somebody who introduces the show to you at the top, who who talks Mm -hmm. to the camera, who Rod Sterling, Alfred Hitchcock, and then also at the end. And so they they bookend it with with these primary people, which is interesting, and they're both black and white, uh, and they both have... They're non-serial. Every episode is different. Anthology shows. That's they're fun. What they're all about. They're That's fun. To watch they're together. bringing them back. Twilight Zone, Jordan Peele, uh, Outer Limits is uh, in the great '90s show. You know, Jonathan Frakes hosted one of those. No. Yeah. So, a lot of good '90s, late '90s anthology science fiction shows. The Outer Limits. They control the horizontal and the vertical. <laughs> All right, we're going to go through this rather quickly because we are running out of time. Uh, as Kishore alluded to, we have the Pixel 3 unveiling uh, coming October 9th. Um, Better be less than $1,500. I bet, I bet <laughs> it will be. It'll probably have some a notch, though. Do you, uh, do you want anything else from the ecosystem? New Daydream? New... I don't... Th- there's nothing else I'm super excited about. But usually they announce multiple products at this. So probably a pickle book? Yeah, another pickle book. What's the pickle book? Pixel book. Pixel book. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, those do so well. Th- that's probably their, their biggest success of the Chromebook line. So maybe like an AirPod competitor. Ugh. I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing what else could I thought could you liked be. the AirPod. Right. But I, I, I don't think Google needs to move in that business. And they, I don't think it's going to do well. F- they took that. off the headphone jack, right? Isn't that gone? Uh, or is that still on the, the Pixel? I don't know. I'm not one with the Pixel really? 2 XL. I only I only have the one. I oh, have the Pixel wow. XL. Well, you'll be staying t- stay tuned for that. Uh, Microsoft has uh, rumored uh, new hardware launching next month as well, October 2nd. And um, curious what that could be. Uh, there won't be any Surface phone, but um, this will probably be new Surface laptops, Surface Pros, and Surface 2s. Could also, it could be soft uh, updates, minor updates with their processors. Uh, we'd love to see... Uh, a new Surface Studio, that would be cool. It's too early for any Windows changes, right? Yeah, yeah, right. It's another couple years before then. Okay. I mean, they're they're on like they're on uh, regular updates, mm-hmm. you know, regular free updates anyway. So um, uh, those those creator updates are way more frequent than the hardware stuff. Um, do, do, do any, oh God, these other stories are so boring. Vizio <laughs> has a has a settlement. To, uh, they've been sending. Um, They're sending owners notifications that their TVs have been extra creepy. In uh, I guess in 2015, we found out they were snooping on their customers with uh, the camera and the microphone on their TV. Jeez. Um, So, uh, sorry, the uh, collected uh, IP data. Not camera. No, not camera. IP (laughs) IP data, personal information, and so uh, there's a, a new settlement. That um, is going out if you have one of these Vizio smart TVs. Okay. I want to know what the notification on the TV looks like. We are sorry for using your TV for nefarious purposes. Here's a notification bubble. Do you want to talk about what you were telling me about the uh, people sniffing their updates? Oh. Yeah, I guess if you're if you're a, into Tesla owner or even in Tesla car. So um, people have their car, their Tesla car. Uh, patched into their Wi-Fi network at home, and they've set up their routers to sniff the packets uh, that go to their car updates and see what servers they ping and get packets from. And that's one way they can then Google those those companies and those addresses to see what type of services that Tesla, Tesla may be integrating into their car. And the latest update uh, for U.S. users 
indicates maybe impending Spotify um, support, which is a very highly requested feature. Some because uh, something surrounding that it was pinging in the Spotify servers. Yes, a lot of data around the Spotify, much like you unusual amount of data from the Spotify servers. I like that people are doing that just to keep Tesla honest about where their data is going. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even if you don't pay for the autopilot, they're taking that data, mm -hmm. the telemetry data from from your driving, and the cameras are still getting information, and that's just part of the part of the deal they want to use to improve their network. Um, this is uh, interesting. Recode um, did a story about Amazon uh, stuffing its uh, search result pages with ads. Have you noticed this? I have noticed this. Like now when I search for an item, usually the top two things that come up are either Amazon Choice mm -hmm. or something that's a sponsored product. Sponsored, yeah. And Which is an ad. It's an ad. It says sponsored, and it's, it's increasingly, it's, if you're on a web page, it is a big part of the top of the page it's and it looks native it's mostly above the fold for m a lot of searches I but do with the, the fold is so tough to discern what that line is between sponsored and unsponsored results but yes it, but it's also native because it's designed to look like just a natural part of the ecosystem mm -hmm. like unless you just spot that word sponsored well, it's just like twitter you know it says promoted you know you gotta well, look for but that there's word. only one of those per like yeah. your initial load that's and not here, true scale, here. It's like here half. it could be two rows. It could be like almost a full page, yep. and they look in line with the search results, and they almost look like editorialized picks. I'm sure they do very, very well. Now, this is not new for any type of retailer. If you go into a Barnes and Noble, if you go into your local Safeway, the placement of your items at eye level at the front, a lot of that is paid for. Cost money, right? Yep. Because for the for the good placement, and we thought the type of like the scarcity of placement went away when you went to search results. Hmm. But it didn't. If anything, the inventory of placement just went up because there's infinite combinations uh, of search results. So uh, it's just something people should look out for and be aware and just feel a little weird. Like you, you hope that their search results will be neutral, but they're not. Like they're, you know, Google puts top results. They're sponsored all the time in front of the, in front of their search results. And, I guess it shouldn't be surprising that, that Amazon do it. At some point, though, users will not be happy because at some point you want the results to be sorted by reviews, pricing, by some well, other When you start searching metric. for specific things, and that's not the first thing that comes up. If I search for Diet Coke and a Diet Pepsi thing comes up, oh, I'm yeah. going to start to get yeah. mad. <laughs> yeah, then, then you have all, every, right, every right to get mad. I wonder if there's a Chrome extension that removes the sponsored from the list. I bet there is. If it's tracked, then yeah. And that should be easy to, to figure out. You're already giving them your money. You shouldn't be sold more things. I, if you have Prime, I shouldn't, be, I, I shouldn't see these ads. Oh, well, how um, utopian. What, what a perfect world I live in, <laughs> in, in my head. Hey, Nintendo Switch's online service launches uh, next week, September 18th. We're all Switch owners here. You guys going to sign up to do some multiplayer on Switch? Didn't occur to me. No, not going to do that. Oh, I don't think so. Nope. Mm -mm. Nope, no, no, I'm not. I haven't officially stolen the device from my child yet, so... Does he listen to the podcast? No. Never let my child listen to us. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Why, why would you do that? Why would you join the Switch online service? What are you doing? So you can play online with other people. Yeah, what are you playing? Mario Party or what are you going to do? Mario Kart? You're going to do Mario Kart with on the online? Mm -hmm. ah. Mario Tennis? It's so much more fun in a little group of people. You like can local network. Diablo's coming out for the Switch. It just supports local multiplayer. That'd be fun. Mega Man, uh, what is it, 11? I'm excited to play that, even though I never once played a Mega Man game in my oh, life. You might not like it. it. I know it's supposed to be hard, but uh, the graphics look great. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. looking, but that's not online. Nope, not interested. You know, I know people hate on it, but I'm more excited about the new Labo. Yeah. Well, what do, well who's hating on it? Oh, there's a lot of people that hate on Labo. You mean Labo? Labo and, yeah. Not the new one, but just Labo. Yes. Because it's cardboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fun to build. It's yeah, it's what it's all about the build. Yeah. Don't hate it. Uh, Google is discontinuing uh, its inbox app because most of its features are now just in oh. the Gmail app. Yeah, that's fine. So makes sense, dude. I still use inbox. Use inbox? On no, I use inbox too. But they like you. You might not have checked the Gmail app recently. It's true. It's a lot of those features. March twenty nineteen is when it will be sunsetting inbox app. So you got you got a couple more months. I still use it on my phone. Like like no, I. I do too, but when but, they switch over, it'll be fine. But on the 10, it was never updated to use the whole screen. Like, I, oh. that's how committed I am. 
Nice. All right. I hope that the, all the stuff I like is in mm. Gmail. Oh, you know something we didn't talk about with the Apple, the the phones, that dual SIM capability is now yeah. on, on the um, the ten the tennis and the tennis max. Mm -hmm. But in the States, it will technically be only one physical SIM and an eSIM. So aren't we just heading towards eSIMs? Yeah. And overall. internationally, they will have uh, China only. different hardware. Only yeah. in China. Yeah. Which is, uh, that's interesting that they've made an entirely different phone for China. Just a billion people over there, I hear. Is, is that true? May, is that I what you hear? Makes, uh, that's what I hear. Science time? Let's do it. Okay, fine. I don't have any pinball news. All right. You tell us. <laughs> I'll find the science button here in a second. Now it's time for a moment of science. I have to start with an apology. Loyal listeners, especially of the video, know <laughs> that I have this one item that I keep here on set that I love, mm -hmm. that I've used more than anything else in this segment. Mm -hmm. Diet Coke can? A printed picture of Antarctica. <gasps> and I do not have it with me today. But we're going to talk about Antarctica. So this weekend, NASA is launching a new satellite to space. It's called the ISAT-2. And you say, what is the ISAT-2? Well, let me tell you about ISAT-1. ISAT-1 was a project that took a satellite and shot a laser down on polar ice caps to understand the thickness, to understand the rate of their melting. So ISAT-2 doesn't have one, la one laser. It has three lasers that are parallel beams that are going to be able to measure wide slots of, of the uh, polar ice sheets uh, much more quickly to understand the rate of change over not only a seasonal time period, but over even like days and weeks. This is most interesting for us to study not the west of Antarctica, which is where I spent most of my time talking about where the Larsen letter C shelf um, recently broke, um, but the eastern shelf, which we know very little about in terms of its melting rates. Uh, this is a billion-dollar project. Um, they really advanced some of the laser technology in the crystals that are part of the, of the laser in terms of their design and how they're grown. These are artificial crystals so that they can get these three parallel beams to be coherent over a pretty long distance. They're shooting them from space, after all. Um, I'm really excited for what, what this tells us uh, about the rate of climate change. We're seeing some pretty phenomenal impacts of climate change uh, currently here in the United States with the uh, increase in hurricane season here in California, seeing the fire rates. So I welcome like this, uh, this extra understanding of what's going on. That's it this week since I talked so much about science in the watch area. Oh, gosh. This podcast can be pretty much Apple discussion. Just saying. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. The countdown continues to Oculus Connect 5. Um, and uh, in the times... Was it two, that, two weeks or yeah, so? Yeah, two weeks. Almost two weeks exactly. Oh, we'll yeah. be down there hopefully seeing lots of stuff. I want to see Stormlands. Can't wait to see that. Yeah. And uh, Echo Combat had a new beta, had a, had a new beta session. Jeremy, you and I played. Kishore did not play. Kishore called in sick. But I had a little con hangover. It was, I was reasonable. Uh, so the combat, Echo Combat beta, included parties for the first yes. time. Yes. So Norm and I were finally able to purposefully play together. Uh, previously, we had to hit start at the same time and hope for the best. But now we were able to join the same game. Strangely, though, we weren't always placed on the same team. That was weird. So we could st we were still in party chat, but on opposite teams. And uh, I don't think that's their intention. That's weird. Yeah. It, it, it only happened once. Was the matchmaking better? Because that was so slow it went real in fast some of the time. early betas. Oh, yeah. No, it was actually real fast. That, that's true. I, I took that for granted. And it could be because a lot of people were playing, and I'm sure that's they were testing yeah. for load. Uh, but it was much much faster. Um, no new weapons, I believe, or new new abilities. Well, there were for me. Like, I didn't I didn't play with the last patch. Oh, so the shield. The shield was new. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there was a new grenade. Uh, there was the proximity uh, stun grenade, as well as that other mm. one. Do you remember that the third one that we couldn't <laughs> figure out? The one, the area of effect one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely some new stuff in there. You still can't punch people in the head, right? Right. 
That's in the this. stun grenades for that. Yeah, so that's the replacement for that effect. Yeah. Okay. I am so curious whether this is gonna be the one map. Like playing this, a lot of fun. Yeah. But it reminded me of TF2, and TF2 would not be as fun if it was only the one gold, gold cart, mm-hmm. minecart map. Uh, I want to see Echo Combat. I, l- I love the mechanic. It feels great. But I want to see uh, more maps. I think three v three is totally fine, but I want to see different styles of maps. And even if it's all that you know, pushing the swan a- across, that's fine. It's a flamingo. For f- the flamingo, but I, I want to see different sideways, like ways to so that you are forced to be nimble and agile and traverse the map and more than just aim well. I was surprised, even though I didn't play with you guys this time, I was surprised how much I enjoyed the multi-room aspect of this to kind of hide around corners and yeah. kind of manipulate your way around people. You can flank people easily that way. I think I, I initially thought I just wanted a big open space with a bunch of just stuff hmm. to get a hide around. So, but I, Oh, like oh, Ender's Game or something, yeah. the, the battle room, or I forget what that's called. Um, I, I'm okay with one map, at least for launch. You know, they got to tweak the mechanics, and th- they can do one map. Yeah. But once they get that dialed in, and they release, great, more maps. Maybe they can even open it up to the community. Oh, that would be really cool. Yeah. A map generator. Ah, that's that's wish fulfillment. I don't know if we'll, we'll ever get there. At least not in the near future. I. They. they, they it's been. We played it E3. We played it in June. It's been a couple months. Yeah. You gotta push this out. It's fun. It's a fun mode. It, 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 for those who don't know, it is a, it is a basically a zero G, um, escort game where you're shooting each other and protecting. You have these uh, mines you can throw where you can see around walls for a moment and grenades. But it's a it's a ton of fun. A lot of people are playing upside down, mm-hmm. using full rotation and playing it. You know, for them, the orientation up is down, down is up, and it really, it's a whole different element because their feet are. The things that are not perfectly tracked mm-hmm. and that to rely on the IK model that can be dangling, you know, their vulnerabilities is, is in different spots. Yeah. And it's um, it, it, totally trippy. Another game uh, that we played, well, that we played a while ago and is out today is Windlands 2, uh, which is I'm especially excited about for the co-op feature. Yes, yes. What, we should, we should what play. show did we play this at? That was an E3, was it? Was it was OC5. Or OC4. Was it a year ago? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we played this and had a really good time. It's especially in light of the new Spider-Man game that came out. I think this is going to have a um, little success. It's, it's going it, to, I don't mean to say a little success. I mean, it's going to be a successful game. It's fun. The swinging mechanic is definitely fun. It's not a mild uh, game in terms of motion. Uh, so, yeah. Push the limits. Please. I, I like it when games push the limits. I wonder, like, I've been thinking about that lately. Have I just gotten my VR legs or what? Because I want more out of my VR now. Like, the, the thing that frustrates me most about the Go is that all of the software is very cautious about moving me through space. And uh, I, I want, like, more than ever before, I want free movement. And mm-hmm. I, I wonder, is that something that I had to learn? Yes. Or have developers just gotten better at giving that to me safely? And are new people? Oh, I think I think both. But to new people coming to VR, they always going to need that teleportation mechanic until they get the hang of it. You know, it's like and lots of vignetting and and no turning. And are are no our kids going to going to just genetically inherit from us the ability to go straight to walking, straight well, to free you're, movement? You're the one with the kid that can that's been in VR. You know. know what's been comfortable for him? Yeah, it's a good question. Does yeah. he prefer in, in rec room? I, and when we play when we play rec room, right, rec royale. A lot of kids are in there, and they're teleporting just fine. Those those are the kids building up their VR legs, mm-hmm. right? As long as the content's compelling, and they've the developers have done the bare minimum in terms of building a fixed point for you to look at and and vignetting, um, then you know they can they can really push the limits because you're focused on the action. Mm-hmm. And um, anything else that we have from uh, for VR? I think that. I don't know. What I think that's okay. it. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, there are there photos of Saber VR, Beat, Beat Saber. Saber VR. Oh yeah, the arcade version. Yeah, that was fast. That it actually they got manufactured. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where this is, but they exist now. You can play Beat Saber. I think it what, was it South Korea, maybe one other place. Yeah. Not, tethered not, overheads. Interesting implementation of not the in VR the headset in an arcade, and and in the photo there is someone who's helping someone else, helping a player put on the headset. So it's not going to be necessarily fully self. Uh, they are Windows mixed reality headsets. It looks like. 
I do so. like the idea of a, of a headset being on like some retractable cord mm-hmm. that comes down from above you. Yeah, yeah. it's a cheap, easy way to not and have, then have like a dispenser for those like eye mask things that you mm-hmm. put on on your face. Right, S- there. super hot. Like in super hot, you had yeah. to pull it down from the top of the room. Yeah. Oh, HTC Vive's VR wireless should be should be coming out soon. Okay. That's uh. You excited that's, about that? Yes. Well, that's good. It's good stuff. It's just yeah. No, I, I absolutely. I, I can't. I can't wait. Uh, when when is the the date for that? I want to confirm. I want to say it was before. Yeah, the global shelf date is September twenty fourth. It's coming up soon. Coming up soon. All right. Um, that does it for VR, and that does it for the podcast. I believe this week. Uh, yeah. Sorry Anything? if you're not a big Apple fan. <laughs> it was a lot of Apple. Anything coming up untested? Uh, yes, we actually had some fun visits to the cave, uh, this past week. Uh, we were went over and to meet up when, uh, uh, a, the puppeteer Barnaby Dixon, who you may have seen videos of on Facebook and YouTube, um, is visiting from the UK and did, gave us some demos and we were able to film that. Uh, you'll see that in the coming weeks. And then Jeremy, you worked on a project with Adam recently, uh, that, I mean, I got called in to do a small bit of a project Adam worked his ass off on, but yeah, yeah. Th- he's going to show that off. I get yes. to, I love having my 1% contribution to his projects. It was a ton of fun. We're going to show that in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. Yep. Look for tested contributors at Maker Fair New York. That's uh, right. That's coming up. That's next weekend. That's, yeah. Not this coming weekend. Next weekend, Daryl Maloney is going to be there. Our friend Jen <laughs> Schachter. Our friend Jen Schachter is going to be there. Adam will be there along with the people Oh, he from, was the surprise te- tested guest? Yes. Uh, uh, Mythbusters Jr. Uh, will be repping there. And uh, we unfortunately won't be there. So we'll be here podcasting. But Tester will be at you. New York Comic Con yes. the week after. Yeah. Yeah. Let us so know. Look if, for us there. Uh, maybe we'll do a meetup. Should we do a meetup in New York? Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, yeah. If you're going to go to New York Comic Con, let us know if you'd like us to do a small meetup close to the Javits Center. Um, I'll be there. Kishore, you'll be there. I and, will be and, there. And Joey will be there as well. Um, but until then, we have an outro for this week, Jeremy. You know we do, because I tried to play it twice. Here it is. From Justin, a.k.a. Speed. Put You're not a that. fan of Iron no, Giant? No, it's too slow and plotting. I don't, I don't care for Iron Giant. That's just my personal taste. I know, yeah. So maybe don't invite me back on the show. Here's the idea for the meetup. Iron Giant screening. We uh, and then we just talk about it for two hours at New York Comic Con. <laughs> we watched Ready Player One, my son and I, we sh- we shared it with hit with my wife, who had not seen it before, nor okay. had she read the book. And she watched the whole thing with us, which I thought was very generous of her. She did not like this kind of movie. Uh and uh she's like, Yeah, I, I want to see what my boys are into. So w- we watched it and you know what? I enjoyed it more this time than... With the expectations being yeah, yeah. set. Yeah, I guess so. I hadn't seen it in a while, and I, I, and I wasn't all invested in it. So I appreciated it as a Spielberg, Spielberg you know, production, and he did a good job with it. I'll give him that. W- would you want to see more? You think that world needs to be explored more? I think it will be better next time. I got my fingers crossed. I think they're on the same page. I think they're going to be on the same page. Because there's no book. Uh, well, not yet, but I have a feeling the book and the movie now, if there's going to if there's gonna be one a new one of each, they'll be a little more intertwined. They have the experience of the last book and movie well, behind they them. they can make a movie. They'll learn Ready something player, from that. Ready to air two, based on the motion picture. <laughs> Need more quarters. Based on the book. Press A <laughs> to join. All right. See ya. See ya.